Good evening, everyone. We got a small crowd. Diwali is here, so everyone is busy with their Diwali. Diwali. But we have a very interesting talk that is going to come on. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine, a classmate of mine, Robert D'Souza. Uh, before talking to about Robert D'Souza immediately, let me say something. Most IITians, 99% of them, after getting their degree, take up a job or do their masters either in their subject or management and are fi finished for other work at all completely. But my friend, Robert D'Souza, is one of the ones who has changed the whole concept of what, what your education has done and that use the education now to work on something else. He did his, uh, no, he's electrical engineer from IIT Bombay, BTEC from there. And also he's got another degree from an American college. But in India, he worked for two companies and then decided that to open his mind out, he wanted to go to, to the US and he and his wife and went down there. And he made himself a career, graduated, post, did his post-graduation and did his career down there. Uh, if you look at it, it what he had uh, wanting for way back in school and college days, he thought he would really take it up. And that's what he did. He decided to uh, for, not to forget his hobby. And what was his hobby? His hobby was wildlife. His ho hobby was photography. And these he built up all the time, built up all, all now. You know, he has been in, gone over to seven continents and been photographing there. Uh, last time he was in Alaska. What for? Alaska, we thought the whales, etc. No, he went to see uh, the salmon and uh, the bears eating the salmon there. So unusual things which we never think of he has been able to do. He has showed us tiny, tiny in insects which have a magic about themselves as well. And uh, Dr. Bharucha, you'll be glad to know that he is a member of BNHS as well as of Audubon Society. So something up your line. And something up my line, what I look at as renewable energy, he has been working. So a guy with a wide range of hobbies, he has been able to use his hobbies to do the right thing for the world. And I welcome, I'm proud of you, Robert, and welcome you to our uh, Wikipedia. And I'm sure this time also is going to be something very magical. Thank you, Robert. And Robert, there you are. Good evening, everyone. Good morning to anybody who's in the US. Uh, happy Diwali to all those who are celebrating Diwali. Thank you, Satish, for that introduction. I hope I can live up to it. This May, I visited Central India, specifically to three national parks famous for wildlife, and especially tigers. This was my first visit to Pinch National Park. However, I had previously been to the other two parks four times each. Although for my hobby of wildlife photography, I've traveled to many parts of the world from the Arctic to Antarctica and from the Galapagos in the West to Australia in the East. The fact that I would visit certain sanctuaries five times each should tell you much as to how much these locations fascinate me. Apparently, I'm not alone in this thinking. Rudyard Kipling's famous books, The Jungle Book, 1894, and The Second Jungle Book in the next year, exhibit his love for the, this part of the world, even though he himself did not spend much time in these areas and borrowed much of his stories from others. His stories romanticized the region and inspired the popular Disney film, the animated film, The Jungle Book in 1967, and then a the movie in 2016. Of course, no story of Central India would be complete 
without the mention of the apex predator and king of the Indian jungle, the tiger. The tiger is the iconic species of India. India is home to almost 3,000 tigers, which is nearly 75% of the world's population. And Madhya Pradesh, of course, is the best place in the country to see them in the wild. It has six tiger reserves, some of them popular tourist destinations, others little visited, and boasts an estimated 526 of the country's big cats, more than any other state. And by the way, this census in 2019 was a groundbreaking census because it went into the Guinness Book of Records with the largest number of, of cameras to take these pictures of tigers and identify them. Initially, identification was done with bug marks, which was not that accurate. So this is a very accurate census too. So apparently, Project Tiger has been very successful because the growth has been uh, steadily going up from 1400 tigers not a long back to went to 1800 2000 now it's about 3000 while tigers is, is both an iconic species as well as an indication of a healthy balanced ecosystem of flora and fauna central india is rich in other wildlife too the tiger, of course, is at the apex of the pyramid of life in the jungle. And for it to survive, many other species have to exist in healthy numbers in the right type of ecosystem. Now, tigers require cover both to hunt as well as to breed, a source of water to drink and cool off in the summer months. Teak and sal forests are ideal for stalking. Bamboo, elephant grass, and rocky outcrops for resting and breeding. We shall let's next look at some of the habitat. As you can see on the right hand side, you have clusters of, of uh, tiger reserves, which are in the northeast, where you have Kaziranga and Manas in Assam, and some good forest in Arunachal. And then you have clusters in the south, southwest, where you have uh, the Badipu, Mudubalai, Nagarhole group of forests. And you'll also see a cluster in the southeast of Madhya Pradesh. And this borders forests in Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand and places like that too. And here, this is exactly where the, the city of Sioni is, which is mentioned prominently in Kipling's stories. And Sioni happens to be in between the Kanha and Pinch National Parks. So you'll understand that this, this cluster of forest is unique because you've got a lot of teak and sal forests in the area. Looking at the forest cover of Madhya Pradesh, you can see that Madhya Pradesh is about the same area as Maharashtra. But if you look at the total forest area is about 50% more. And about 11% of the total forested area in the country. Similarly, other areas which are contiguous like Chhattisgarh and Jharkhand, which are much less than the area of Uttar Pradesh, have a much higher forested area. And this is important because as I mentioned earlier, tigers need this type of habitat to breed and to hunt. 
In fact, Chhattisgarh Jharkhand is another 11% of the forest in the country, as against 2% UP. UP because of maybe cultivation, a lot of forest has been lost there. Maharashtra, the same thing. Although it does have very dense forest where it borders Madhya Pradesh. And in fact, Pinch National Park, uh, part of it is in, in Maharashtra. Looking at uh, Madhya Pradesh itself, you can see these parks at the bottom. Pinch is here and Kana is here. And above that is Bandavgarh. The Pench and Kanha are in the Satpuras, and Bandavgarh is in the Vindhyas. You can see Sioni is out here, which was mentioned by Kipling. Kanha, of course, is the most famous park in MP with its diverse habitat. Beautiful sal forest, bamboo, elephant grass, wet and dry ravines, open meadows, water holes. Bandhagar is more rocky, which makes it ideal for tiger breeding. And that's why it's one of the reasons it has the highest tiger density of any sanctuary. Pinch became popular fairly recently because of its legendary tigers, Kolarwali. It was called Kolarwali because she had a collar on her, radio collar. She gave birth to a record number of 29 cubs in eight litters, out of which 25 survived. Unfortunately, she passed away early this year and was given a huge funeral by all the forest department people. This slide shows you a typical sal forest canopy on the left and the type of streams tigers like to stay near. In fact, there was a tiger in this picture, but it's too far away to see clearly. Termite mounds are very common in this type of forest and strangler vines also. As you can see with the strangler vine, predation is not confined to animals, but also to plants with trees sucking out nutrients from a host tree and meanwhile looking for another tree before the host tree dies. One has to look carefully at trees for signs of life. As you can see here, there are scops owls in this tree. So very important thing when you're in the jungle is to keep your eyes open and your mouth shut, as many people would say. Animals, of course, need a lot of water. And these parks are dotted by water holes. You can see the machan next to this water hole. And water holes are also ideal places for tigers because they can ambush prey. You see the grass gives you a lot of cover. And of course, also, uh, you see the herds of uh, these are Barasinga, which are staying well away from the edge of the forest because of fear of uh, getting ambushed. So these are the three Kipling country parks, which I talked about earlier. Kana is the largest, of course, and it's got a large buffer zone too. Kana has got uh, an animal which is not found anywhere else, and that's the Barasinga. Barasinga, why? Because it's got 12 tines to its antlers, and it was on the endangered list, and it got down to as low as 70 numbers only. But fortunately, there was a very, very good uh, director of Kana National Park, H.S. Pawar, who did some captive breeding and other uh, systems which brought the Barasinga numbers to what it is today in the hundreds. So Barasinga is a beautiful 
uh, deer and you'll see that in certain areas in the park. Bandha, of course, have got, Bandha has the most number of tigers. It's got a lot of rocky area, which is ideal for tiger breeding and also good for leopard breeding and sloth bear. We didn't see leopard on this trip. The leopard is very difficult to see in India, although in Africa, it's, and of course, Sri Lanka, it's, it's much easier to see. Pinch has got a lot of bird life. And that's another huge attraction. At the entrance of Kana National Park, one can see a, one can see a huge arch made up of antlers. Most people know this, that deer shed their antlers every year and grow a new set at the entrance of this Kana Park, this, this antler arch is the largest one at least I have heard of. And there are arches of antlers in Alaska and also in uh, other parts of the US, which are made with moose antlers and with elk antlers, which are much, much smaller than this. This has got literally thousands and thousands of antlers. And uh, it's of the four species of deer in the park. The spotted deer, of course, the sambar, the barasinga, and the and these. The smallest one is the barking deer. And this arch kept falling down till they managed to put a steel reinforcement in. But what's behind this arch is a conservation story. At one time, people in the village used to burn the parts of the forest to be able to see these antlers easily and collect them and sell them to the trade. The people make decorative things out of antlers. And uh, the forest department uh, stopped this practice because of the forest fires were of huge danger to wildlife. And they started collecting these antlers. And this is how they were, they built enough to make this arch. Out here, you will see another conservation effort. And this picture, you see what is known as a boma. This is a conservation technique in Indian sanctuaries. The word is borrowed from Africa. In Africa, they build thorny enclosures to keep predators away from their livestock. Like the Maasai people, they do that to keep their cattle safe from livestock. In India, it has a different function. Now, this is a triangular enclosure, and you can, what you see here is this, the opening is a, the smallest end of the triangle. And uh, it is lined with hay to reduce stress level and injuries to, to the herbivores, which are grazing. And areas get overgrazed, they try to move the herbivores to other areas. So as the herbivores enter this enclosure, it is made smaller and smaller. And then finally they get into this opening and there's a truck which takes them to other areas where the density is low. So it's another conservation effort. One thing which was apparent here was the Tremendous bird life. I mean, we only think of tigers and large mammals, but there was tremendous bird life in these areas. And you can imagine because on this 10 day trip, we saw over 80 species of birds, a tribute to the biodiversity in this park. And of course, it is home to about 300 species. So we'll just look at some of the birds in this area. And uh, the peacock, of course, uh, doesn't need an introduction. And we found peacocks dancing in the meadows, the front of the peacock, even the rear. So the male turns around so that uh, the female gets a good look at both front and rear. 
and uh, both sides are impressive. It's a very impressive dance. And this was fairly common in Kanha. The red jungle fowl, this is the ancestor of our domestic fowl, and uh, which is found in India and parts of China. We also have the gray jungle fowl, which is a bit more rare and found only in peninsular India. And Madhya Pradesh is about the northernmost tip of where you see the gray jungle fowl, which we never saw on this trip. But the red jungle fowl is more impressive and uh, very, very shy. I was very lucky to get it out in the open to get this picture. Gray hornbill, uh, quite a fruit eating bird. And this bird may be familiar to people uh, in the cities and villages, the cockle or crow pheasant. It's actually neither a crow nor a pheasant, it's a cuckoo species. And of course, uh, fishing eagle, gray headed fishing eagle. As I mentioned, water holes and lakes and all are very common in these parks, rivers. So you have lots of water birds too, like these uh, lesser whistling teals. They are found in fairly large numbers in the lakes. So, white-breasted kingfisher, another very common bird in the forest. In fact, the most common kingfisher in India. It doesn't need to be near water. It feeds on lizards also, apart from fish. The corborant, another fishing bird. Uh, corborant does not have that oily layer on its wings, just like ducks have. So it needs to dry out its wings after a dive. Crested serpent eagle, another indication of a healthy forest where there's lots of reptiles as well as other insects. It can even feed on caterpillars. And it puts up a large crest that you can't see in this picture when it's excited. This is a very common bird in the cities, the red vented bulbul and the green bee eater again. Uh, the green bee eater, of course, has a very high success rate. 80% uh, of the time it catches the insect it is after, as against the kingfisher, which is about 30% success rate. But of course, the kingfisher's prey is larger, so that makes sense. This is the orange-headed ground thrush, a beautiful bird. And the Indian pita. The Indian pita is called Navrangi in Hindi because it's got nine colors, a very colorful bird. No picture can ever do it justice. And no one angle can show all the colors, really, because it's, it's a beautiful bird. Uh, it's on the ground all the time. Now, a bird which is not colorful, very camouflaged is the Indian stone curlew, also called the thick knee. Uh, now this is a fairly close up picture, but if you saw it in the brush, it's very, very difficult to see it. Even um, in one case, the, the guide was pointing it out to me and I couldn't see it for a whole five minutes. This is the, the honey buzzard. This happens to be a male, which has got a red uh, iris. The female is yellow there. Robert, sir, can you remove the black thing on the top? It's on the top of your, yeah. Yeah, yeah, get rid of that. Now it's come in the middle. No, that will go. Yeah, okay, now it's perfect. Perfect, go ahead. Okay, this is a button quail. Very small bird, which is fairly camouflaged, but really very colorful. The yellow wattle lapwing, 
another ground bird. And this is the barred jungle owlet. Uh, I was lucky to get it out in the open. Normally it's, it's always covered by something or the other. And the scops owl is half asleep. golden back woodpecker, a beautiful bird. Again, no picture does it justice, really. And a tree pie. I did get some flight pictures in this uh, because, of course, uh, every photographer tries to get flight pictures because it requires a little more skill and patience. So this is tree pie in, tree pie in flight. White-eyed buzzard in flight with nesting material. Racketail drongo. This is a very interesting bird which has got a racket at the end of the tail. It is a mimic and can mimic the calls of many other birds. And it's another sign of a healthy forest. This is the hawk cuckoo which which is very, very commonly heard, but very seldom seen. And its call is like a one, two, three, four. And you can hear it incessantly throughout the morning and the evening. The black-headed oriole, this is not a very good picture, but just to show you, I've got a picture of this bird in flight. And it's interesting to see how they have different patterns of flight. This one, uh, puts its wings together and then out again. So that's the way it flies. That's interesting to watch also. Then the Indian roller, it's called the roller because the male rolls in the air with a fantastic display before the female. And of course it's got other courtship things like giving the female, as in this picture, a present an insect in part of the courtship. And this is Rola in flight. Again, another picture of Rola in flight. Um, it's a very beautiful bird in flight with the Oxford and Cambridge blue in the wing. And this picture would show you a peacock uh, dancing uh, I apologize, there's no sound in this. I took this picture without sound. Otherwise, it would have been more impressive. But you can see, you get the idea of how it turns around. Uh, the female is just outside the frame of this picture. And it... Uh, to give the female a good look at both sides. And it's quite common to see this in the in the summer months. So it's done a full 360 degrees. Can you imagine carrying that weight of feathers all over the place? Another problem is that uh, when its attention is distracted by uh, this courtship rituals, predators also choose this time to attack uh, the peafowl. 
especially jackals and even leopards. And of course, uh, coming to mammals, out of the 37 species of mammals that live in these parks, we saw 12 and were able to photograph nine species, which is pretty good for just 10 days. We saw the Indian hare, which is, which is a very lucky sighting because this animal is normally crepuscular, which means it's found only early morning or late evening, but we got it in broad daylight. It was very camouflaged again and very close up picture. Um, so very lucky sighting in the daytime. And then of course the common langur is all over the place. And they are, they form strong bonds with the cheetah, cheetah or spotted deer because uh, uh, they can see color vision, which the deer cannot. And that helps to distinguish tigers in the stalking them. Here you can see a langur at a water hole with one lookout and three people drinking. And uh, this is Barasinga, which is the one endangered deer I told you, which now is improved in numbers. You can see the antlers and uh, it's normally found in grass of about this height. So it can look over the grass, look for predators. So that's a female Barasinga. It's quite a beautiful deer. This is a spotted deer, the most common deer in India called the cheetal. This male you can see has a broken antler. It must have been in a fight with another male. And here you can see a cheetal at a water pool. Cheetal, doe and fawn. They're posing for me. Mongoose on the way to a water hole. And of course, jackals, which are found scattered all over the place, waiting for remnants of tiger kills and sometimes making small kills of their own. Barking deer, that's the smallest deer in these parks. Very shy, very timid. That's a langur, mother and child. This is a samba, young male. And that's the female. Samba is the largest deer in India. Uh, one of the tiger favorites food. Uh, the male goes up to about 700 pounds which is almost 330 kilos. Now these are the scratch marks of a tiger, normally sharpening, cleaning its claws, marking its territory and so on. And they also uh, leave scent marks in the territory. Here you see tiger cub uh, footprints, Unfortunately, we never saw tiger cubs. We came very close to seeing them, but uh, somehow we did not. Uh, see tiger taking in scent markings. And tigers, of course, crossing a stream. They are one of the most comfortable cats in the water, along with jaguars. The other big cats don't like to get into water at all. Tiger cooling off at a water hole. This was a young tiger which was startled by uh, some monkeys in the trees, some langurs. And it was looking to see what was going on. This is tiger stalking, cheetah. 
And you can see the, the concentration in the eyes. And actually, I got a full sequence of this talking. But unfortunately, some over-enthusiastic people drove their four-wheel drive vehicles in front and disturbed the cheetah as well as the tiger. And we never got to see the entire hunt. But that would have been a rare experience. Here you can see another picture of it. It is crouching in the leaves. Another one, you see the paw lifted up is just concentrating on its prey, nothing else. Unfortunately, we didn't see the entire stalk. Tiger, of course, uh, roaming its territory, going towards the waterhole. This we thought were two uh, brothers, but it turned out to be a mother and adult male, a sub-adult male. Um, these uh, guides are really good in the forest. They know the, they know literally the lineage of these tigers. And they've been seeing them grow up from cubs. This is typically tiger at a water hole. And uh, one has to be patient to get pictures like this because uh, once it's taken, it looks very simple, but sometimes you have to wait for hours. Especially to get a picture like this, uh, it took me like three hours at this water hole. So, it depends to what has the patience. Of course, if you don't see tiger, uh, you can look at this picture. It is estimated that if you take a morning drive for about four or five hours, approximately eight tigers have seen you. <laughs> and you although you may not have seen even one of them. And this is the last slide. Uh, for those who are interested, you can see these pictures on my website on the link below. And uh, I can take some questions now. Uh, Robert sir, Apoorva, uh, one question that you were talking about this, um, the symbiotic relationship between the cheetal and the langur. So the langur with its color vision can actually, um, uh, it can act as a lookout for the tiger, right? so that the tigers don't attack the cheetals. So Who's what is the case? Apoorva. Who's Apurva, I Apurva, yeah, yeah. So uh, what does the uh, cheetal offer to the langur? Uh, the cheetal actually also gives it uh, um, cover because the cheetal also have lookouts. Okay. And sometimes okay. the langur can't see exactly where the tiger is coming from. Okay. And uh, the langur do help cheetal in another way too, and that's when they're feeding. The fruit falls, half the fruit falls on the ground, and the cheetal snap it up. So they do have a close relationship because lookouts are required on the ground as well as in the air. The tiger is very, very stealthy. Uh, I don't know if some of you have seen uh, David Attenborough's series on life in color. Uh, you can see it on Netflix. And it's, uh, it's a three series, three parts uh, to it. And it shows how the tiger sees and how the cheetah sees and how the langur sees. Yeah. And it's very interesting. You discussed this in the last uh, uh, session that you had with us. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, uh, and anyone else before uh, I ask a query? Uh, one more question, sir. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, there, there was a picture of a tiger actually lapping up water, but I thought he was looking at you. <laughs> uh, was it? Could he spot you? Was he aware that there is a person, or there are people who are, or are they used to people? Yeah, they are. They're pretty. They're pretty aware. Okay. They're pretty aware that they are people. Tigers actually try to stay away from people. <coughs> okay. And uh, 
it's surprising, but they they are scared of people no. in a way. No. And uh, they will try to move move away rather than confront. And uh, what is the equipment you have used for this? Uh, I used it by, I was using my new camera, the Z9 Nikon. Oh, the mirrorless. Uh, yeah. yeah, with a 500 mm lens. Okay. And a 300 mm lens for some some pictures. Okay. And how does the autofocus work in such long distance? Yeah, this this camera has got uh, AI on it. Okay. So it does lock in the eye and focus, retain focus very well. It does work pretty well. And did you have a tripod or are these all hand? No, these are all handheld, yeah. Okay. Right. Some some places I, I use a bean bag. Yeah. Uh, tripod is not very uh, practical. It's difficult to set up, yeah. Yeah. But a bean bag is uh, is more is more practical. Okay. Uh, another question I had is about uh, the uh, the migration because all these parks are close by. So do you think uh, we've heard stories that uh, tigers migrated from or lions migrated from somewhere to other between the parks? Radio collar fitted uh, tigers were spotted. They walk from somewhere to somewhere else. It's and, true. And a supplementary question, what do you think of the forced migration by the government that there are too many tigers here, so we take them and put them somewhere else? And a supplementary question to that is, what do you think of the cheetahs coming from Namibia into India? So please take it. I think you asked. Yeah, I've done that. Yeah, Yeah, thank you. Very good questions. Please, Robert. That's that's a lot of questions. Uh, Yes. uh, So basically, uh, talking first about the migration, local migrations, yes. Wherever there are contiguous forests, that's forests which are touching each other and all, uh, migrations do take place. And that's how the tigers have always been in the past. In the past, there were no sanctuaries. Tigers don't know borders. So they do migrate depending on the movement of their prey, of the cover available and so on. So if the if the prey move to other areas because of, of the grass being totally eliminated uh, of overgrazing areas, then the tiger will move also. And so that migration does take place. As far as cheetahs, uh, the last cheetah was, <coughs> excuse me, killed in India 1950. In fact, Kana was one of the places where it had black buck and cheetah were the predator black buck with the prey in the grasslands in the maidans of Kana. But but of course, the predator always disappears before the prey species. And cheetah became extinct in 1950. Now, introducing African cheetah is an experiment. Mm -hmm. It may work, may not work, because it's a different subspecies of cheetah, but uh, they're very, very similar. So it could work. Provided it is very well regulated. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but will, will it be able to scan the weather? Isn't it different weather, different feeding habits, etc., than what it found there? Uh, or have they taken care of all that? Yeah, the weather is pretty similar in the parks where it is compared to, uh, to Africa. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think that's one reason why. The cheetah were not introduced in Gujarat, but introduced in MP. And that's because in Gujarat, it's a more uh, drier climate, which is not there in the East Africa. And uh, because that would have been the ideal place. Velvada in Gujarat has got thousands and thousands of black birds. It's ideal cheetah habitat. But they've, they've chosen... Uh, this place because I think weather also matched. Oh, but the new camera is giving better results than the old one. I've seen both your presentations and I can tell you that uh, the, yeah, the color... flight shots flight shots of birds become easier. Yes. Sir. Thank I, you. Sir. I think so far. Yeah. Yeah. I, I so think these are your questions. Asked, yeah. Eraj, Eraj, your questions, your remarks. Please switch on. And then Sandeep, you have to come in next. Um, uh, thank you, Robert. Always nice to see some nice pictures. Uh, Central Highlands are my very favorite uh, uh, place to be. 
Uh, but uh, what uh, interests uh, me is how Rudyard Kipling's stories uh, fascinated me as a boy until I became a little older and realized that there was much more to understanding the Central Highlands, which comes from two people. Uh, there was a, a forester called Forsyth who worked in the 1800s. And by about 1920, 1930, there was Dunbar Brander, who uh, in those wrote the book. 50 years, was 50, 60 years, was able to say that the population of various animals was falling and specifically mentioned about the Barasinga. So this Barasinga thing, which happened later, was through Shala and Sankhala, who wrote about the deer and the tiger and uh, tiger, tiger, two books that came out in the 50s. Very interestingly, the saving of the Barasinga was really uh, by two people, Ranjit Singh Ji and Pawar. One yes. was uh, Mandla's uh, district collector and the other was uh, in charge of tiger, early tiger project in uh, Kano. In fact, Ranjit Singh wrote the uh, Indian of good science uh, for uh, tiger ecology. And a little bit about, uh, you mentioned the Barasinga. Uh, today it is being translocated into Bandagad. It's successfully also being translocated now into Satpuras. So we've got two other locations because keeping an endangered animal in one pocket is a very risky thing to do. A uh, little bit about uh, my concern is uh, that when I started talking about this 40, 40, 45 years ago, I had sort of felt that tiger tourism was a very good idea, that it would get more people involved and so on and so forth. But today, tiger tourism has become an enormous threat uh, to habitats and wildlife because of sheer numbers. And we need to control those numbers. We need to do this in a very scientific way. We need to understand the carrying capacity of different parks. And I think this is uh, still something which we haven't sufficiently worked about. But a little bit about uh, what fascinates you and what fascinates me is uh, wildlife photography and, and the joy of photography, which um, I've enjoyed for so many, many years. It's something where you get satisfaction as a photographer, but also people like us who today have watched your uh, pictures get an enormous uh, pleasure out of. But today's uh, photography, which has become very important to the science of wildlife, is uh, how we put up camera traps, how many you should you put up, where do you put them up, and how do you use that data for better habitat management? And I think this is something which most people who go there for a holiday don't really understand that there is a lot more to what has been written about and that in the last five, 10 years, there's been an enormous increase in the knowledge that we have about conservation, uh, not just about the tiger, but about habitats. And the fact that uh, today we have got the tiger uh, in this increasing number is the success of uh, Project Tiger. And uh, that has all come about more and more now through science, to understanding corridors, understanding habitat locations, understanding niche areas of other different species who share tiger habitats. So I'm very happy uh, sitting here listening to you. And uh, yes, the Central Highlands is a fantastically different set of uh, habitats from everywhere else in the country. Thank you very much, Robert. Uh, Robert, you, any response? I just want to say oh, a couple of things. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Ranjit Singh and Pawar. I happened to meet them both when Pawar was uh, director of Project Tiger in 76, my first visit to Kanha. And I was struck by the dedication of both these people. And I knew that uh, uh, Project Tiger would be in, you know, in safe hands. And the one thing they've done is to, for tiger tourism is that they've not allowed private vehicles now in these parks. So only so many 
gypsies, which are forest department controlled, can enter the parks. And that's a good thing, I think, very positive thing. So earlier, private vehicles could just drive around all over the place and uh, disturb the animals. Okay. Uh, Sandy, Sandy, your turn. Hey, Robert. Uh, first of all, I think uh, these pictures were just stunningly beautiful. I mean, Thank outstanding you. job uh, in terms of both uh, in-flight as well as the still pictures. Of course, the in-flight pictures are also still, but they feel like they are moving pictures. One question, uh, two questions. Number one, when you use your photography equipment, is your primarily gear Nikon and everything else is non-Nikon? Are you also uh, your 500 millimeter lens, for example, do you tend to use other people's like, like Sigma or anything else? That's my first well, question. Yeah. And then, yeah. then I will answer the second question. Yeah, no, I use only Nikon lenses. Uh, the Nikon had come out with this uh, 300 and 500 mm lens with Fresnel elements. And Fresnel elements give you tremendous uh, reduction in weight and size and uh, retaining the sharpness. And the 500 has become so popular that it goes out of stock every now and then. So yeah, these are all prime lenses from Nikon. I do use a Nikon zoom also, but all my lenses are Nikon. I've got an 80 yeah. to 400, but I tend to use the prime lenses now because the sharpness and the uh, the range of uh, tonal range and all you get is uh, is amazing. Yeah, thank you. I and think one I, more question. I. Yeah, I, I have one more that question. question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I have, I, by the way, I ask that question because sometimes the uh, lens cost starts exceeding two, three times the, the, the cost of the body. And then you always have well, that's to That's a good question, it. actually. That's a good question. But Nikon have come out with these lenses, which are also economical. I see. So the price also is much less than the price. Let me give you an example. I don't have Z lenses right now, which are meant for this. So I use the adapters use the old F-type lenses, if you're familiar with that. But yeah. Nikon have come out with the Z 800mm lens, which is half the weight of the old 800mm lens was $16,000. This is this lens is $6,000. Yeah. And the weight is 5 pounds as against 10 pounds. Yeah. So tremendous. They've done tremendous uh, research and into... The, the lenses they come out with now are the, in my opinion, the best lenses. Yeah. Of any my way. second question. Yeah. My second question is, as I was looking at the diversity of your pictures, one thing that came to my mind, on one hand, we talk about survival of the fittest. That means your, your color schemes, your behaviors uh, uh, are as normal as the background. So you always camouflage yourself. On the other end of the ex uh, extreme, I feel like all these coloring schemes, whether it is birds or animals, uh, is focused on one specific objective, which is to attract female. And, and I wonder if it is, <clears throat> I have often wonder whether it is all about survival of the fittest, or it is all about just attracting the females. Of course, when you attract the female, you propagate <laughs> your species. But the primary objective is not really camouflaging, but it's to make yourself attractive. That, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, to give you an example, there's a butterfly called the Daniad eggfly. And this uh, Daniad eggfly has got, the male has got beautiful blue and uh, white markings and a uh, very, very attractive butterfly. But of course, predation would be pretty easy because you can see that butterfly pretty easily. The female of that butterfly is uh, mimics the plain tiger, which is a butterfly of the Daniad species, which, which uh, feeds on milkweed plants and is distasteful to birds. So birds don't attack it. So the female needs that camouflage for procreation the male needs it to attract the female. So you have both in one species. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, I think Gaurav has been waiting. Gaurav, have you got anything to say? Uh, so, uh, first of all, brilliant. I mean, lovely, lovely presentation. Thank you so much for your for sharing your images with us. And uh, so, I don't really have any questions. I just wanted to add that, uh, you know, until recently, I was visiting Central India quite often. Of course, not having the advantage of visiting it over a span of 30, 40 years. But, uh, you know, uh, Kana is my favorite uh, park and Pench is a close second. So uh, all these images really brought back a lot of nice memories for me personally. So thank you so much for sharing them. Uh, we, we have a question from Bharat Doshi. I'll just allow okay. him to talk. Yeah, uh, say... yeah Bharat uh, Doshi, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I did. Uh, yeah. And unmute as well as if you can. Hello? Yes, please, please go ahead. See you also. Yeah. So uh, the, the question was uh, related to Tiger, and you mentioned that they are very worried about people. Is that mainly to protect themselves against injuries? Because once injured, they are basically dead, they can't eat. Um, it's possible because. Over the years, uh, they've been hunted yeah. by people, and uh, it's possible that they uh, associate humans with danger. Yeah. Uh, just like uh, tigers and uh, lions in Africa literally run away from Maasai people because Maasai traditionally used to hunt them. So they are scared of them. And in mm -hmm. fact, you have 14 year old Maasai boys herding cattle right in lion country. Uh, the lions have nothing to do with them. Yeah. And this is a daily occurrence, not something one-off or something. So yeah, I feel that is, but that's my conjecture. I don't know. Okay, yeah. Because exactly. I, I see photos of uh, people wearing basically human mask on the back. So mm -hmm. the tiger will, will not attack them from behind also. Because the tiger will feel that there are real human beings. That's a good question, actually, because in the Sundarbans, uh, there's been a shortage of uh, prey for the tigers and the tigers uh, have multiplied there a lot because of the cover, so good place for breeding. And there have been man-eaters in the Sundarbans. But tigers' natural instinct is to stalk prey from um, where the wind is favorable. The animal is not looking at the tiger. The moment the animal looks away, the tiger moves forward type of thing. So it might have some relevance, but I'm not sure really whether it does help. G Gaurav wants to ask another question. Go ahead, Gaurav. Uh, sorry, not a question, just a small opinion I wanted to add. So, you know, since uh, this was Central India and Tiger Reserves especially, uh, I just wanted to add, uh, you know, we had the small debate about... Uh, wildlife tourism. So uh, like you said, it is regulated and yes, it probably could be regulated better. But uh, I just wanted to add that in my experience, it's a very nice stepping stone for getting those who are not generally interested in nature, getting them interested in, uh, you know, all the wild things. So, you know, tiger tourism is your first step and then, you know, later maybe bird watching and then later butterflies. And, you know, it's a I think it's a very useful uh, stepping stone. Uh, that's a good, that's a good observation actually, because uh, the moment you limit the encroachment and the in, you know the in human interference, the better it will be. That's why in places like Galapagos, they don't allow more than a certain number of people on an island at a time. And the same thing with uh, Antarctica, you might go in a big ship, but only hundred people can get on shore at a time. So if you limit the amount of human intrusion, it's always better. Is there some okay. sort of education that is given to the people who come that please keep your mobiles off, uh, make sure that you don't disturb the animals? I mean, that is one thing because the sort of cultural uh, things which come up and they disturb the animals. Yeah, I know. I think uh, what happens is the the guides depend on these people who come in for tips. And so they can't really enforce anything so clearly. We saw many uh, 
I mean, many people who obviously were looked to be very uh, wealthy type of people, and their drivers became very aggressive trying to go towards the tiger. In fact, I was talking about that stalking incident. One of those uh, tigers had some, I think, some Europeans or something on board, and they wanted to show them the tiger at close distance. So they rushed in front and and ruined that entire stalking moment. And they would have got much better pictures if they had just stayed there. And we would have seen the whole sequence. It is It was so stupid, actually, to do that. But they did it anyway because they thought they, they'd be rewarded with a good tip if they were close to the tiger. If you get very close, you can't really get good pictures. You've got to get okay. some background in too. Okay. Uh, let me interrupt. Any other questions are there? Okay. Can I ask, uh, uh, just say, go off the point that you are say, saying. Uh, do, do you know that the Jungle Book, that, uh, what was it written by... by, by uh, coupling. Coupling has yeah. been considered racist and they're thinking of whether to ban it in America, in English uh, schools. It is, I remember reading it about a couple of months back. That is one thing which stuck me that we didn't do anything about it. And tigers and the Adivasis who are staying down there, can they live side to side? It's one of the more difficult questions to ask. Did you see the feel the urgency, etc., when you were there? The, the difference with whether it, the human being can go in and help himself or wood or whatever or, and the tigers and the other animals, how, do, how they can take it. Yeah. So basically, uh, tigers have been living alongside human beings for, for centuries, for ages. And that still continues there. There were these forest department people working, uh, collecting brush, you know, to reduce the forest fires. They clear certain areas. They collect the brush. And they were there in the forest. So... So basically, that is uh, uh, one of the things which which has been happening. Uh, take leopards, for example. Leopards have been around villages for hundreds and hundreds of years. You would have incidents every day if they really attack people, but there are not. What is your opinion on the cheetahs? Is it worth the while having the cheetahs brought in? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I think it's a good thing to to promote uh, an animal which used to exist in India. It's not that mm -hmm. it is a, it's not an animal that it did exist in India. It's very, very similar to the species which we had. So it's good to promote, but one has to support it with the the right type of habitat, right type of prey, and so on. Okay. Uh, I think Gaurav Nalkur and Bharat Doshi, do, do you have any other questions or shall we close this? Uh, uh, so one more question. Uh, yes. uh, has there been, uh, yes, uh, one. Uh, what yes, I would sir. like you to do, ask the last question and give vote of thanks. Yes, I'll do that. So one question is that has And, there... and don't call me, sir. Sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm young at heart. What do you say? That, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the question I had is, uh, has there been a successful, uh, you know, reintroduction of a species in India and they have flowered, you know, in the sense that these guys come in or we've got some bird or we've got something or is it the first time that such an experiment has taken place? Well, uh, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, uh, they have, uh, like, they have done, like, uh, you mentioned Barasinga is one area of which, which has been fairly successful. As long as you look at all the entire ecosystem and not just that animal, uh, it is possible. It's possible to introduce a species and uh, help them grow. Uh, one boring area is the gear lions. Uh, the Asiatic lion is the gear is the only area right now, and there's a lot of inbreeding and it's creating lots of. Uh, problems for the health of the lions. So if we, if we could uh, reintroduce lions in other areas where they were earlier, it might help to 
promote the species. Yeah. But, but as the I political people, politicians do not want to release uh, the lions from uh, Gujarat. You know that. Yeah. So that's another thing. Right, sir. Okay. On I this, think, yeah. Apurwa, on yes, this sir. note, I would yeah. like you to give a vote of thanks. Yes, sir. And we'll I'll do that. Again. Yes, sir. Uh, hey, Apurwa, Apurwa, can I yeah, just, just, yes, please, just please, one please, question? Please before. go ahead, sir. Alitsa okay, also. Yeah. I just wanted to ask Robert, uh, I didn't see any mention of uh, any animals from the alligator species, which tend to be uh, to balance out uh, people coming, not people, animals coming to drink water <laughs> as, a, as a balancing mechanism. Did you see a lot of animals from the alligator species? Yeah, the, the streams in, um, in Kana and all of that, I think are too small to to house crocodiles and things like that. But you know, I did see monitor lizards. In fact, I photographed monitor lizard. I didn't show it to you, but monitor lizard around the water hole. Uh, but that's the largest reptile I saw. Okay. And of course, to see a python and all is very difficult in a 10 day trip, but they would have been definitely there in the forest. Reptiles are there. Now, if you go to Rantambor, which is the got a fairly large lake, there are crocodiles in that lake. In fact, there was a famous tigress, Machli, which, which killed a 14-foot crocodile. A very famous tigress. Huge she was in, the, in that lake. And there was another well-recorded incident of a tiger snatching its kill that killed a sambar in the lake. And the crocodile had pulled it in. And the tiger waited on the bank for about a couple of hours plucked up the courage, went into the water and dragged the carcass away from the crocodile and brought it to land. Then the crocodile let go. So... Uh, yeah, Worthwhile looking at those for quick photos. Thank I'm you sorry. for answering all the questions, Robert. Thank you. Yeah. Erich, sir, do you have a last question? Yes, please. I was, I was, yeah, yeah, I was uh, comment because it's something interesting that came up which is about reintroductions today. Yes. Uh, cheetah is the first uh, transcontinental introduction that we've tried to do. But in India, we've done many very successful introductions in the last, last decade or so. Uh, Gaur, which had disappeared from Badnugad, has been brought back from Kana. And uh, they're breeding successfully in Badnugad now. We've got XC2 programs for vulture and great Indian bustard. Both very successful. Vultures have already been released back into the wild from uh, Pinjor, which is the BNHS project. Bustards, which uh, we should have been breeding long, long ago, didn't happen for 20 years of arguing with the forest department about doing this. And today we've got large number of chicks uh, in already uh, an ex situ situation in which in a year or two, I think we should be able to release back into the wild. So you know, these are the success stories that we have. Yeah, and I, I think it's important that we continue XC2 conservation so that we learn about XC2 conservation, not wait till it's, till it's the end point and the animal is about to disappear. Then you start uh, doing XC2 conservation. So we need to understand the specialty zoos that we need for doing this. Eraj. Hey, one yes. little question that I wanted to ask you. We had gone to Panna about three years back, just before the... And we saw on the other side of the river about 70 vultures. And I don't know what they were, etc. I couldn't spot them. They're quite a distance away. Even though we climbed up on something and tried to see them, I couldn't. My camera isn't that good for all that work. But yeah. I wanted yeah. to know what it was, etc. They were they are either they were either white backed or long billed, um, and uh, they aggregate there where there is a tiger kill which is left and abandoned and so on, and sometimes cattle also. So that's unusual to see seventy odd birds, but uh, where you see this now, it's only in protected areas because there's no diclofenac around there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but what I saw was on the. Uh, 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 the thing, uh, rock, rock face. The river is way down. 
and the, yes. the rocks are straight up down there. And there were yes. hosts of uh, this. I tried to count and uh, I was told by the, the local guy who was there, hey, yes. Yes. So now Very they have, very very small you, pockets like that and individual pockets which are in only in protected areas where uh, veterinary doctors are not using diclofenac. Yeah. Okay. I, someone wanted to say about something about it. Who was it? Who had shown a, a card? Hello? Is it yeah. Bharat Doshi? No, we have done. We are done with someone, everyone. No, about the vultures. Someone was put up a card suddenly and disappeared. Bharat uh, Doshi? No. Gaurav, Gaurav, you had said something. Okay. I think yeah. let's forget yeah. it. If okay. you have a question, yes. send it to we'll us. Do. We'll ask the concerned people. Yeah. And uh, Apurva? Yes, thank you. With you. Uh, yeah, uh, Robert, sir. This was an absolutely uh, fantastic presentation. And uh, we look forward to having you again in another aspect. Maybe a continuation of the same uh, outing. Maybe something else. We'd love to see the monitor lizard, for instance. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for all the participants, all the attendees. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good Bye. night. Thank Bye. you, Robert. Thank Bye. you all. Thanks, guys. Good Bye. night. Sandy. Good day for us. Bye, Bye sir. Yeah, thank Good you, sir. Us. Good night. Bye. Good day. Happy Diwali to you all. Happy Diwali Happy to Diwali everyone, Diwali. sir. Happy Diwali to everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.